Welcome to Lingthusiasm, a podcast that's enthusiastic about linguistics. I'm Lauren Gorn. And I'm Gretchen McCulloch. And today, we're getting enthusiastic about metaphors. But first, this episode was originally posted as a bonus episode in August of 2019. Ever since March 2017, we've been doing bonus episodes alongside main episodes every month for people who support us at the Lingthusiast level and above on Patreon. They're our way of thanking people who support us on Patreon. As a show that doesn't have sponsors or advertising, it's your direct support that keeps the show going. The good news is that we're not part of some network that can just decide we're not allowed to make the show anymore. When we first started the bonus episodes, they were a bit shorter than the main episodes because we wanted to make sure that it would be sustainable to keep up a regular production schedule. You'd think after doing this show for eight years, we would have made Lingthusiasm a lean and efficient production, and yet it turns out we still take a lot of time to put these episodes together because we just keep having higher standards. Yeah, we definitely do a lot more research now because some of the early topics we covered were stuff that we already had a whole bunch of background on, and so we didn't need to do quite as much digging into other sources mm. and asking other people, uh, our many linguist friends and colleagues, for their suggestions and input, which we do a lot more of now. And this is also true for the bonuses. They went from being these like 10 to 20 minutes on things like the linguistics of swearing or what we mean by the word sandwich. And then they very quickly, like within about 12 months, became very similar to main episodes, both in length and in structure and the amount of research that we do. We do sometimes do a bonus episode that is a deep dive into a single research article, mm -hmm. like the time we discussed Bill Above sneaking a rabbit into a primary school. Mm, yes, classic. Or the time we talked about the very classic salad salad paper, which is about, you know, when you have like egg salad and potato salad and then salad salad. We also have bonuses where we've done things like attempt to create a computer generated transcript of Lingthusiasm with Janelle Shane. Or we've done Q&A episodes. We have at least 90 bonus episodes available to you right now, which make a really fun catalogue of listening alongside the main episodes. And they can be a bit of a blast from the past if you go back to some of the very early ones. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or if you're someone who's always got a lot of podcast episodes on the back burner, and you don't really need more listening material, but you just like to help us keep existing long into the future, we also really appreciate your support for whatever reason you want to give it to us. We're really proud of our bonus episodes, and we wanted to give them a bit more attention, so we've taken this older bonus to share with you today. And also, frankly, this gives us a bit of a break while still giving you something to listen to. Yeah, it's nice to have a bit of a breather. We've been putting up monthly episodes since December 2016 and bonuses since March 2017, and we've never even been a day late on those. I'm very impressed by us, Lauren. <laughs> we've definitely got into a good routine, and we plan to continue sharing many more mains and bonuses with you. But it's really fun to also get to revisit some of our older episodes. And occasionally building in a break into our production schedule is something that also helps us keep the show sustainable. So this episode is all about how metaphors are something that is deeply embedded into the way we talk about everyday things. What's one thing you noticed about re-listening to this episode, Gretchen? So this metaphor episode aired right around the time that my book, Because Internet, was coming out. And you can hear how I'm maybe a bit nervous about that. In fact, the original intro had a call to pre-order the book, which... <laughs> so we sweet... cut that. <laughs> We've cut that because uh, you can that actually order it now. You could just buy it. It's fine. It's so funny to think because internet has been out for five years. Uh, I mean, it's also a complete testament to your work that it is so relevant after five years, which is like half a century in internet time. Yeah, I've still seen people recommending because internet to each other, even just this week. And there's actually an extended metaphor in the final chapter of Because Internet about how we should think of language like a massive collective participatory project, hmm. like the internet itself rather than as a book, which is static and unchanging. I can't believe that past Gretchen didn't think to give myself a plug in the previous version of this episode. <laughs> <laughs> what did you notice listening to this episode, Lauren? I was really confused how we got through a whole episode on metaphor, and we didn't talk about metaphoric gestures, which is like a whole category and one that I've been obsessed with for a really long time. Well, that may have been because we talked about gesture and metaphors two bonus episodes earlier in the interview with Alice Gaby. Oh, yeah. We talked about time and space metaphors, how time yes. 
which is not a kind of thing you can easily pin down, we often use space to talk about it. So in English, we talk about and we gesture about the past being behind us. And we talk about looking ahead to the future. This pops up in a lot of Western cultures in speech, in gesture, and even in the way that signed languages in Western cultures construct how they do tense. So ASL, American Sign Language, has the past behind us and the future ahead of us. And so does LSF, French Sign Language. I haven't checked all of the other sign languages in the LSF family because it's a huge family. But this seems to be something that carries over from a similar cultural context. Yeah, it's the same for Auslan and other signed languages related to BSL, which are not related to American Sign Language, but they share this cultural metaphor of the past behind you as an influence on the tense system. I mean, that's not the case for all languages. There's Amara, which is spoken in like the north of Chile and in bordering countries. And in Amara, there's a metaphor about the past being in front of you. Which, when you think about it, actually makes sense because mm. you can see what's already happened and you can't see what's going to happen. So it makes sense to put, put that behind your head where you can't see it. But that's just not what we do in English and a lot of other Western cultures. Yeah, and I remember in that episode, we talked to Alice about her work with Cook Tayor in northern Queensland here in Australia, where their metaphor for time is that time moves from east to west, just like the sun. Oh, that makes sense. But they don't use it in their speech, they just use it in their gestures. Oh, yeah, like how English speakers will gesture from left to right for a sequence of events, whereas speakers of languages that are written from right to left would gesture in the other direction. Yeah, and there's also evidence of Chinese speakers gesturing from top to bottom for time, especially like oh. discussing different generations in a family, which is part of the writing system influence on gesture. It's so interesting how metaphors get picked up and shared between cultures and how there are so many different levels of embedded metaphor in how humans do language. It was really fun to record this original episode and absolutely a delight to revisit it. Just a quick note that this bonus is before we went through our second major round of updating our microphone situation for this show. Again, a nice way to look at how far we've come, <laughs> look back two times before. But at least it's after the first time that we've updated our mic situation, which we would not subject you to. Both of those were thanks to patron support. If you want to get access to over 90 other bonus episodes like this one and many, many other topics, there's a new bonus every month at patreon.com slash lingthusiasm. Lauren, look how far we've come. Mm, I just, I feel like we're at a crossroads. Are you saying... We'll just have to go our separate ways. I just feel like we can't turn back now. I don't know if this relationship is going anywhere. I mean, this year has been a long and bumpy road. It's really a dead-end street. <laughs> okay, so... <laughs> how, okay. how long do you think we can keep that up for? <laughs> <laughs> we are not breaking up the podcast, not breaking up the band, don't, don't, please don't worry about this. We are merely exploring how you can use an extended metaphor to talk about a relationship as a physical journey. So a, a metaphor is when you take features of one thing and you apply them to something else is the like the most basic way. So here we're talking about a podcasting friendship, but we're using all of these features of a physical journey to talk about that. Things like going anywhere, long bumpy road, dead end street, crossroads, turning back. Some of these are so ingrained in the way we talk about relationships with people that you don't even necessarily think of them as metaphors anymore. Something like look how far we've come or we'll have to go our separate ways is technically a metaphor. Like going different ways is a physical thing you can do. But it's so ingrained in the way we talk about emotional relationships or friendships or these kinds of things that we don't even necessarily think about them as a metaphor. Yeah, I mean, I'm still going to be here in Melbourne. You're still going to be in Montreal. If we were to, quote unquote, go our separate ways, uh, we would not change anything about our physical location. <laughs> in fact, if we were to go in different directions, we would statistically probably end up closer together on this physical Earth orb. Close together, yeah. Just saying. Mm. <laughs> but we're so used to thinking in metaphors. And I think this idea of extended metaphors, I think when I learned about metaphors in high school, it was like, you do one clever thing in one sentence with some words. But actually, the thing I love about metaphors is that they are 
kind of pervasive in the way that we think. Yeah, like I remember learning the kind of like my love is a red red rose or something like this, and think, okay, well, you know, that's fine. I guess this poet's going to do this. But the kind that are really fascinating are the ones that we use every day without even thinking about them as much. Do we want to do a bit of etymology? Yeah, I think so. So metaphor comes, you know, via French, via Latin, from the Greek metaphora, meaning transfer, from meta, which means over, and ferro, which means to bear or to carry. So the meta also shows up in other prefix like metaphysics, which is like over physics, or sometimes you talk about something being very meta, it's beyond the literal sense. And fair, meaning carry, shows up in... Oh, like transfer. Well, that's the Latinate equivalent. Fair shows up in other words like paraphernalia, which are like the extra things you carry around with you, or semaphore. Semaphore like the flags? Yeah, like the flags, which I guess are like probably signs that you carry. Hmm. Yeah. And it's less directly related to F-E-R in Latin, as in transfer itself. So a metaphor carries something over, carries an idea over from one domain to another, and often from a concrete domain to a more abstract domain. This goes back to one of our favorite themes on the show, which is the idea that humans are just giant meat puppets and language is always kind of tied to the very physicalness of our human bodies. Yeah. And so even when we're talking about really abstract ideas, it's easier to do so if we invoke very physical things in the world. And you find that a lot of the metaphors have a consistent, especially like even if you look cross-culturally, there's some variation. We'll talk about that. But overall, there's these common features where if something is good, it's upwards and bad is downwards. Happy is upwards and sad is downwards. There's this kind of correlation between this and it has to do with the fact that we are bipedal and vertical beings. And we have to kind of struggle against gravity. So if you manage to succeed against gravity and stand up, that's probably good. If you're lying flat on the ground, maybe you're dead or something. Yeah. And another one that I really like is phrases like to grasp a concept or to gather what you've understood. And that uses a physical action of picking up or holding something as a metaphor for understanding something. So again, like ideas are very vague and abstract. And so we turn ideas into physical concepts, like little physical blocks. I could give you this idea or we could put all ideas together. Yeah. Or sometimes we use sight to talk about ideas. I see what you mean. That sounds clear to me. Those are using a different metaphor to talk about a similar domain because ideas are very abstract. I had a really fun experience a few months ago when I learned that the German word wichtig, which I'd always kind of had trouble remembering. It means important. And, you know, that's fine. Like, they clearly didn't borrow it from Latin and French like English did. But I always was like, okay, wichtig, that sounds like it should have some sort of word that's related to it in English. But that word that I think of it being related to in English is definitely not anything sounding like important. And then I learned that it could also be translated as heavy, which is also gewichtig, Mm. which thereby makes it cognate with weighty. Oh, a weighty idea. Yeah. A weighty idea is an important idea, right? That sits really well with me. Yeah, exactly. And even if I wouldn't necessarily talk about a weighty idea myself, I can use that as a memory peg for, oh, wichtig, something's a weighty idea, it's it's important. Or a person is is wichtig, they're weighty, they're important, they've got dignitas and gravitas they're bringing into the room. We are absolutely by no means the first people to observe these features of metaphors as being very grounded in our experience and kind of extended across lots of little examples mapping onto this one big idea. This is something that's come out of a field called cognitive semantics. George Lakoff is one of the key practitioners. You may have heard of him. He likes to do public commentary on kind of big cultural metaphors a lot. Uh, But lots of people have been working on this over the years, kind of documenting or looking at these pervasive metaphors, looking at how they vary across cultures. One of my absolutely favorite things about this area is a study by Gettner and Gettner from 1982 that shows how not only do these metaphors kind of exist in our brain, but they can affect the way we think about um, and, and process information in the world. So they had a study where they were teaching people how electric circuits work. Okay. And they had two different metaphors. So the first is moving people through a series of passages. So like tunnels, like you might send people down to the subway in or something like that. Yeah. So that was your wires, are your courses or passages, and then your... Um, electrons? Electrons are little people. Okay. And then the 
Current is how many people kind of can go through the passage. Voltage is how many people are pushing. Um, so you map those things. So they taught a whole bunch of people that metaphor for how an electric circuit works. Okay. And then they taught a different group of people a metaphor for electric circuits on a hydraulic, like, water pumping system. Hmm. So now your pipes are your wires yep, and the water is like your electrons or something. Yep. And then the flow rate of the water is the current as opposed to the flow rate of people. Right. Okay. So once they taught them these metaphors and like, you know, you kind of figured them out as soon as I said them, they have obvious mappings between the original domain and these areas that they were using as metaphors. Um, once they taught people the metaphors, they got them to think about electrical systems using the metaphors. So things like serial versus parallel battery configurations, which is definitely a thing I remember learning about in high school physics. Don't really remember the science behind. I don't think I did. If I did, I don't remember it, but I don't even know if I ever learned it. And they found that because the way batteries are cabled up If you have them like all lined up together or you have them all coming off different cables and coming back, it affects how things like voltage and resistance work. Okay. If people learnt the flowing water metaphor, they could figure out the better outcome of how that works. Having Hmm. the water pumped through different pumps was a better analogy for batteries. But if you were looking at serial versus parallel resistor configurations, and who amongst us has not? um, (laughs) (laughs) Me, actually. (laughs) The crowded passages of people actually gave you a better metaphor for correctly predicting what would happen in that circumstance. Oh, that's interesting. So different metaphors can help you reason about different domains. Yeah, but a metaphor can only take you so far, right? So even though both of them are pretty good metaphors and like you could figure them out even without knowing a whole lot about how electrical systems worked. And definitely not know anything about resistors or batteries. (laughs) The metaphor can only go so far. Yeah, right. That makes sense. And I mean, we do this sometimes when we're coming up with episode topics. We'll say, okay, we're going to need a metaphor to talk about verbs. You know, what are some physical objects that have similar properties to the things that we want to talk about with respect to verbs or with respect to sounds or various other types of pieces in language, which can be fairly abstract, to say, let's give people a very concrete objects that they can touch or they can visualize and have some sense of how it works. We spent ages with the coat rack one, which was explaining how verbs kind of help structure sentences. And we kept stress testing the metaphor. Yeah, I remember that one because we recorded that episode when I was visiting you in Australia. I remember we went for a walk, you know, the day before we recorded it saying we need a metaphor. Let's talk through a bunch of different possibilities. Like, what are some things that have multiple relationships with each other? And I ended up being very pleased with the coat rack metaphor in that episode, but it took us kind of walking through a bunch of different other metaphors. I know we rejected like the, the verb is like the skeleton and the other parts of the sentence are of like body parts that can hang on to that because <laughs> one of the big problems. <laughs> you can rearrange coat racks much easier than you can rearrange human skeletons. <laughs> yeah, we really didn't want to go super gruesome. <laughs> uh, even though sometimes a skeleton is used as a metaphor, like this is the backbone of the industry or the skeleton key can open different things, something like that. But so skeleton is sometimes used as a metaphor in a non-gruesome sense. But in this particular context, we want to talk about things going on and off. It was just going to end up really bloody. <laughs> and the thing I found fascinating is we recorded that whole episode and we actually had different physical coat racks in our minds. Yeah, because you had the coat rack in your mind that's like kind of you like hanging against the wall. No, I I had the freestanding coat rack. You had the freestanding one. Maybe I had the one hanging against the wall. I kind of had both, maybe. <laughs> Turns out Gretchen's idea of a coat rack is much more fast and loose than mine. I have a very specific yeah. physical model in my head when I was building the metaphor. Well, I think because I think I call a coat rack like it has to be hanging against the wall versus the other kind I call like a hall tree or a coat tree. That's a cute metaphor. Yeah, it's also a metaphor. Look at that. But it doesn't really matter because in the end, the thing that was relevant of like how many hooks do you have and these kinds of things was sufficiently parallel for the particular thing that we were talking about. There are actually people whose professional job it is to design metaphors. That's a pretty fun job. Yeah, it almost seems like a very cool job to me. One of them is Michael Erard, who works for the Frameworks Institute as a professional metaphor designer. I think that was an institution that Lakoff founded, right? Uh, Yeah, he's definitely involved in some way. I think he founded it. One of the examples of a metaphor that they designed at Frameworks was looking at children's executive function. So kind of like how your 
brain is organized and how much you control how to do things as if it's air traffic control for your brain. Hmm. So air traffic control are obviously those people who are like telling the airplanes when they can come down. And the insight that they had from this was, yes, it's important to be organized and training and runway space is also important, but ultimately there can also only be so many planes in the air. Right or you just overload your brain's air traffic controllers. So if you're wondering why children are, you know, frustrated and unable to do all the things they want to do, maybe they can just only keep so many planes in the air. And you can support that to a certain extent by improving the organizational skills, but you can't expect people to keep more planes in the air than they're capable of doing. Yeah. So in order to kind of sell this metaphor, they had to do what we do for the episodes and kind of test them and make sure that all the implications of the metaphor aren't potentially problematic. Yeah. And there was another metaphor that I remember reading Michael Arad criticizing, which was there was some sort of uh, metaphor about dandelion children versus orchid children. Oh, dear. <laughs> and the problem with this metaphor is, is that, okay, these are two different flowers. People know what these flowers are. Like, you know, they, they certainly give you... Th I can't... I'm trying really hard to sit here and be like, dandelion children are uh, yellow? No, because you get yellow orchids. <laughs> Do you get yellow orchids? So is it dandelion children, supposedly, according to this metaphor, can kind of bloom wherever they're planted, whereas orchid children require more delicate care and feeding. Right. Or delicate emotional attention. Oh, I was thinking of irises. <laughs> <laughs> In theory, this is a useful distinction. But the problem is, is that people have very different values associated with dandelions versus orchids. Mm -hmm. And so everyone's like, oh, great, I want my kid to be an orchid kid. And that was actually what they were trying to call attention to as like, it's dangerous for your kid to be an orchid kid. How can we create more dandelions? Because dandelions thrive everywhere. In my brain, it's like weed children versus ugly children. <laughs> y yeah. So, I mean, some people like orchids, Lauren. <laughs> and the problem was, is most people on average like orchids more than they like dandelions. And so it, it, even though the metaphor kind of works from a characteristic property sense, I guess, it also comes with a value judgment that like ultimately made it not a very good metaphor for trying to help people improve their parenting practices. Was also ignoring a, a lot of other characteristics. Yeah, like make your child more like a dandelion and less like an orchid is a really hard sell to parents. Every time I think of orchids, I think of people using like little spray bottles. So now I'm thinking of people like spray bottling their children. <laughs> it's just, you know, like they're very finicky. They They grow in these like you know, greenhouses and stuff like that, whereas dandelions will just grow on the cracks in the sidewalk. So it's, you can see why maybe you want your kid to be able to bloom wherever they're planted. Like, that sounds like a good idea. And yet orchids are just so rare and valuable that this also seems like a really good idea. But one better metaphor that I actually heard Michael Arad talk about at the Polyglot Conference in New York City a number of years ago was that uh, he came up with a new metaphor for language learning. And he said that it's a developing a complex skill like weaving a rope. Hmm. And so in this metaphor, a good rope has many strands, which have to be woven together tightly in order for the rope to be strong. Yeah. And so the strands and the techniques of weaving the rope are kind of like the skills that you begin with and that you learn and you develop as you're doing it. But the rope won't weave itself. And so it's not just like you learn the language and it's done, is that you're building up all of these different strands and putting them together. And, you know, that you have a lot of time and effort going into putting it together. And then once it's complete, the rope is a usable thing, a tool. You can do something with language when you've learned it. But some people think of learning a language as like, I don't know, filling a bucket or something, like you poured in the language and there it is and you never have to do anything else. Yeah. And so this idea of emphasizing the process and all of the different steps of learning a language could be useful to people thinking about their own language learning more productively. Nice. I like that metaphor. Yeah, it's quite nice. Um, because I think, you know, as linguists, we often face the kind of like, how many languages do you know question? And the no implies that there's an endpoint. And if you talk about weaving a rope, it's very clear that there isn't one logical size of rope that like, then you have the rope, that a rope can be potentially infinitely long in theory. Yeah. It's like, I now just have like a few strings of Polish. Exactly. Yeah. You can conceive of having different amounts of, or like I have some like raggedy old, <laughs> uh, whatever language that I've forgotten, or I've, I've just acquired the shiny new string of, of another language. We've talked a lot so far about metaphors kind of being, uh, shared in a particular group of people. And like, you know, when you have the cultural references, dandelion children versus orchid children make sense. But, you know, even as someone who is ostensibly from, the culture that that metaphor was designed for, I failed. And when you look across cultures, you do get culturally grounded knowledge that's required to understand metaphors. And um, I teach this with a metaphor from the Songhai language in Mali. I want you to kind of see what you can make of this metaphor, Gretchen. 
Okay. The words of the elders are like the droppings of the hyena. Okay. So I've definitely never seen hyena droppings. Mm-hmm. Um, but words of the elders are probably good, right? So that must mean that this culture thinks the droppings of the hyena are also good, which means that I'm reasoning from the, the abstract to the concrete domain rather than the other way around, <laughs> which is presumably what this metaphor actually wants me to be doing. You're um, back, back logicking. Yeah. If I'm thinking of like the droppings of like a bear or a deer or something, which is an animal that I'm more familiar with, you could use those to tell where they're going and maybe be better at hunting them. So it gives you information and clues and stuff. So maybe that's also what they think about the hyena droppings. I mean, I guess the first thing is that, like, equating anything with poo is generally seen as negative in our culture. Right. So, so I was trying to be positive, because presumably they're not like, oh, those elders, they're they're talking such bull, you know. Bull poo. <laughs> BS. <laughs> the culturally relevant knowledge that you need here, or the, like, locally relevant knowledge that you don't have, is that hyena droppings are, like, opaque and cloudy when they're first done and then they kind of become see-through and transparent. Ooh, I don't know how this works, interesting. but this is apparently a fact. This is not a chemistry podcast. And so the words of the elders are initially unclear and opaque, but like a good prophecy, they become clearer or their wisdom becomes clearer over time. Oh, that's really good. That's really elegant. Yeah, it is a really elegant metaphor, but only if you know how hyena droppings work. Yeah, which clearly I didn't know, so I was just trying to base that on other droppings of other animals, which don't have this very specific translucifying property. And I think metaphors are always one of those... There are sentences when I've learnt languages where it's like, I understand each one of these words. I don't really know what this sentence means. Yeah. Because metaphors are definitely some of those more elaborate rope-weaving parts of the language learning process, to borrow Michael Arad's metaphor. Yeah, and understanding the literal words doesn't necessarily mean you have the cultural context. Sometimes it's a cultural reference, like if you're making some sort of, like, oh, this is from a game show 30 years ago that everyone used to watch and we still make this reference, but actually, you know, if you haven't seen this game show, you don't know that's where it's coming from or something like that. I think also we've talked a lot about, you know, that metaphors are kind of persistent and they they have these big extended uses, but just because we have a kind of cognitive image of how things map from one domain to the other doesn't mean that we don't mess them up. And people do mess them up. (laughs) Um, This is known sometimes as a malophore, which is like a metaphor, but gone bad. Specifically named after, I think, the Dickensian character Mrs. Malaprop, who used to get words mixed up, but also just mal in general is bad. And so you get things like, I wouldn't trust him with a 10-foot pole. Oh no, that's combining I wouldn't trust him as far as I could throw him? Yes. And I wouldn't touch him with a 10-foot pole? Yes, and then you end up with I wouldn't trust him with a 10-foot pole, which like you could say, but is not an existing metaphor in our culture. But but it's actually quite satisfying, because it combines both of them. Yeah, exactly. So I've got a list of some of these malaphors. Excellent. If you, Lauren, would like to try to identify what the original metaphors are, or we can go back and forth if you want, because maybe... Yeah, let's do that. And if you're playing along at home, you can get your phone or your computer out and hit the pause button and argue away with people that you're listening with. Yeah, see if you can guess before us. (laughs) Okay, do you want to go first then? Sure. Don't judge a book before it's hatched. (laughs) <laughs> ah, this is definitely true about my book. Okay. So I think that's combining don't judge a book by its cover mm-hmm. and don't count your chickens before they're hatched. What about every cloud has a silver spoon in its mouth? Oh, this is riffing on silver for both of them, I think, because it's yeah. every cloud has a silver lining, which means that like even bad things can have good bits to them. And... uh if someone's born with a silver spoon in their mouth, which I used to imagine literally, it's the problem with metaphors, <laughs> but it just means that they are super fancy. You mean your baby was not born with a silver spoon in thankfully, his mouth? Thankfully. Literally? Thankfully. <laughs> um, yes, I think that's what those are. It's not rocket surgery. I think that's pretty easy, right? So it's not rocket science and it's not brain surgery. I guess you could also have it's not brain science. <laughs> Doesn't that's doesn't quite, quite, not quite as catchy. Doesn't quite capture it, does it? You can't teach a leopard new spots. Oh, you can't teach an old dog new tricks, but you can't change a leopard's spots. Yeah, that one's like a really elaborate mashup. That one's pretty elaborate. 
Uh, the train has left the frying pan. So the train has left the station, and I guess the frying pan out of the frying pan into the fire or something. Yes,、yeah, so the, the train is on its way to the fire. I guess is the <laughs> visual image we've got going here. Yeah.、Um, until the cows come home to roost.、Uh, until the cows come home. Is that a yeah? Thing? Until the and your chickens come home to roost. Yeah, I think until the cows come home is like we'll be talking about this until the cows come home, like forever. Yeah. And then the chickens come home to roost is. Another farm metaphor. <laughs> I guess we should say that metaphors also just encompass like general aphorisms and sayings, which may not actually be metaphors in the way we always think about them, but they're kind of all grouped in together like this. And because they're so fun to look at, and because they're so fun, we're just gonna share a few more until the pigs freeze over. Oh, this is good. So this is until pigs fly with until hell freezes over. I guess you could also do until hell flies, but I don't know if that works as well. It'll be a walk in the cake. Ah,、uh, see, this combines. It'll be a walk in the park with. It'll be a cake walk, and a cake walk is a thing. I do not know what it is, but I know that it means that it will be easy. So when I was in school, they used to do cake walks sometimes as like charity fundraisers. What was that? They weren't especially easy, and I don't know if this is the only kind of cake walk there is. But they were kind of like musical chairs, but like the last person left would win a cake, basically. Oh. Combines a thing I hate, musical chairs, with a thing I love, winning cakes. But it also shows how idioms and metaphors can contain like fossilized knowledge that we now no longer have. Yeah, exactly. A cakewalk is now more common in a saying than an actual event in my life, although not in yours, apparently. And then we also get, in addition to kind of the very tightly. Mixed up metaphors, you get longer mixed metaphors, which is when you end up with two metaphors referring to the same thing. So ideas can be both things you you grasp and also things you see, but mixing them in a way that seems sort of weird. So something like, if we can hit that bullseye, then the rest of the dominoes will fall like a house of cards. Checkmate. You've got a whole bunch of different <laughs> game <laughs> metaphors all stacked up on top of each other. That each of them would work individually, but together they end up with a really confusing set of imagery. Should say that was Futurama character Zaf Brannigan, known for being a bit of a dolt.、Um, so that was like that was a very deliberately constructed mixed metaphor. Yes, that's true. I mean, this tends to happen with maybe only two examples in a in a more realistic sense. But I guess it shows how the brain can kind of operate with different metaphors happening at the same time. Can we end this episode with my very favorite metaphor pun? Yes, please. Metaphors be with you. <laughs> For more Lingthusiasm and links to all the things mentioned in this episode, go to lingthusiasm dot com. You can listen to us on all the podcast platforms or lingthusiasm dot com. You can get transcripts of every episode on lingthusiasm dot com slash transcripts, and you can follow at lingthusiasm on all the social media sites. You can get scarves with lots of linguistics patterns on them, including IPA, branching tree diagrams, Buba and Kiki, and our favorite esoteric Unicode symbols. Plus, other Lingthusiasm merch like our Etymology Isn't Destiny T-shirts and aesthetic IPA posters at lingthusiasm.com/merch. My social media and blog is Superlinguo. Links to my social media can be found at gretchenmcculloch.com. My blog is allthingslinguistic.com, and my book about internet language, now somehow five years old, is because internet. Lingthusiasm is able to keep existing thanks to the support of our patrons. If you want to get an extra Lingthusiasm episode to listen to every month, our entire archive of bonus episodes like this one to listen to right now, or if you just want to help keep the show running ad-free, go to patreon.com/lingthusiasm or follow the links from our website. Patrons can also get access to our Discord chat room to talk with other linguistics fans and be the first to find out about new merch and other announcements. Recent bonus topics include playful mishearings like spoonerisms. You mean runespisms? <laughs> <laughs> Mondegreens and eggcorns, as well as an episode on comparatives and superlatives. The best, and an episode on do support. And don't mind if I do. Can't afford to pledge? That's okay too. We also really appreciate it if you can recommend Lingthusiasm to anyone in your life who's curious about language. Lingthusiasm is created and produced by Gretchen McCulloch and Lauren Gorn. Our senior producer is Claire Gorn. Our editorial producer is Sarah Dopiarella. Our production assistant is Martha Zutsui Billens. Our editorial assistant is John Crook. Our music is "Ancient City" by The Triangles. Stay enthusiastic. Enthusiastic.